Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with a midweek update in the world of cannabis. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos and there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top US MSOs that you think are going to be worth more in the future than they are now, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. But it's now official, so happy to announce the governor has signed uh, their legalization bill making Minnesota the 23rd state to legalize adult use cannabis. So huge win for those in Minnesota. You get home grow and you stop getting criminalized for cannabis, which is great. And while personal possession becomes legal as of August 1st, the unfortunate news is that January 2025 is when legal sales will have to wait to launch. And so Unfortunately, until then, it does invite the gray market to run rampant. Let's just hope Minnesota doesn't turn into New York and have so many illegal outlets by the time that they officially start to launch their legal ones. And so with that, I just wanted to recap this from the U.S. Census and U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis and AGP. So much so that we've now hit the halfway mark where 50% of Americans 21 and older now live in states where adult use cannabis is legal and accessible to them. So that is a huge victory for Americans, one that is not talked about nearly enough. While 54% of U.S. GDP did come from states where cannabis is legal, Better to see that coming from states where it's legal than not. And I do think it's promising as this highlights that there are more Americans with disposable income in states where cannabis is legal. And as long as there are legal outlets, they are willing to vote with their dollars for legal cannabis, uh, unless it's New York, obviously. But, you know, it's promising 54%, and I bet these numbers will continue to trend up. While this one from Fast Reveal highlights some of the latest uh, predictions for the coming year, USA legal cannabis sales could surpass $33 billion in 2023. And we're really only expecting Maryland to come online as of July 1st. But that will no doubt drive some more sales. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but do invite you to pause read if you're interested. But just to relay last year, uh, a report by Business Insider indicates that a 20 that in 2022 alone, Americans spent an estimated 30 billion on legal cannabis products. And I believe that was up from say 27 billion in 2021, where we saw a big jump because of stimulus checks um, and new markets coming online. So of course, hey, had New Jersey and New York been a different story, 2022 could be a different story as 2023 would, but we got to live in reality. And so pause to read here if you're interested. Otherwise, we'll scroll down a little bit. You can pause to read this bit. There's a little bit more, I think. Otherwise, grab the full link in the description if you are interested. But with that, on to some other news. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley says cannabis legalization is best decided at the state level. Obviously, every Republican presidential candidate should be saying this out loud. If 91% of Americans want you know, cannabis reform and legalization at the federal level, it's where people can show the power of their voice. Now, not like she has a chance or anything, but thank you, Nikki Haley, for speaking common sense. And hopefully some of the other presidential candidates with a better chance of winning will pick up on this and run with it as well. Um, but doesn't stop the feds wanting to violate the Second Amendment of cannabis users. You cannot make this shit up. And so it's infuriating. But got this as of this morning, uh, relaying feds warn cannabis users about new Minnesota legalization law. So again, right? Uh, while we want to celebrate the victory of ending cannabis prohibition, the feds certainly don't want to give up their control. Until cannabis is legalized federally, firearms owners and possessors should be mindful that it remains federally illegal to mix cannabis with firearms and ammunition. But if you want to mix alcohol with firearms and ammunition, have a blast! Brought to you by the U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Cannot make this shit up. And with that, thank you, Peter Reynolds, for sharing this study from Forbes, which we'll jump to in a moment to show some highlights of. But study, stereotypes and myths about cannabis consumers blown apart. Love more data to highlight this. Only 10% are 18 to 24, which is great to highlight. Uh, much smaller percentage than expected are younger users, um, which is great because if their brains are not developed, let them wait till they're a bit older. Turns out most are 25 to 54, with 53% say they use for both medicine and pleasure. That's more than 50% right there is saying they use it for medicine, while 42% medical only. Yet cannabis is still in the schedule one because it's too addictive to prescribe and has no medicinal value. Come on! And so I invite you to pause to read as we go through this. From Ford's The Typical Cannabis Consumer, a new report dispels stereotypes. Of course, because propagandists are not very good at creating stereotypes because they need to be based in some what of truth, and propagandists usually live in their false narrative. Hence, love to have this data proving them wrong. But to highlight notably, that use was recent. 39% of U.S. adults said they'd use cannabis in 2022. The report revealed an even larger percentage, 42%, said they'd use cannabis in 2023. And you'd hope that all of these people are being honest and that there still isn't a group that's too shy to say that they've tried cannabis because they don't want the feds coming after them. I'm sure there are some that exist, but significant finds about consumer motivation included. So pause to read for this a little bit while more consumers and 83%. Well, I invite you to pause to read for this bit. Um, yeah, only 10% down to uh, a political. 
and then wanted to highlight this bit down here for medical reasons. The survey broke down the reasons for those doctors' recommendations, which legally cannot be prescriptions. Insane. Chronic pain, 46%. Migraines, 21%. PTSD, 17%. Osteoarthritis, 10%. Rheumatoid arthritis, 9%. And neuropathy, 9%. I'm surprised inflammation is not in there, but maybe it's a bit too general. So anyways, you can pause to read the rest if you're interested. Otherwise, grab the full link below in the description. Uh, but with that from preprints.org, this study that is not peer-reviewed yet, but I don't really care because I think what's more important to consider is the volume of studies that point out cannabis's medical benefits uh, as opposed to the harms versus whether a study is peer-reviewed or not and funded by by most likely big pharma, but to highlight the anti-inflammatory effects of cannabis sativa extracts on LPS-induced cytokines release in immune and non-immune cells in vitro. And I feel like I've seen this study over and over again for years, but this is another one from May 22nd, 2023. Inflammation is the response of the innate immune system to any type of injury. Although acute inflammation is critical for survival, meaning our body's working and homeo I think homeostasis is functioning, dysregulation of innate immune response leads to chronic inflammation, and that's what's not good and can lead to cancer and other issues. Many synthetic anti-inflammatory drugs have side effects, and thus natural anti-inflammatory compounds are still needed. And while we've had them for thousands of years that humans have used them for. And the fact that they've only been illegal for the last 100 years is the anomaly. Cannabis sativa L may provide a good source of inflammation-reducing molecules. And so they tested it. We found that pretreatment with CBD, THC, or extracts containing high levels of CBD or THC reduce the level of induction of various cytokines. Huh, what do you know? The CBD was more efficient than THC, and the extracts were more efficient than pure cannabinoids. A uh, bit more here that I'm just going to skip over because it's very scientific, but thus our work demonstrates the potential of use of cannabinoids or and cannabis extracts for the reduction of inflammation and establishes IL-6 and MCP-1 as the sensitive markers for the analysis of the effect of cannabinoids on inflammation in microphages. Hence, maybe why we have an endocannabinoid system. I'm not sure. Just sharing this though, obviously reason to deschedule cannabis and look at the studies further, especially when these studies prove the exact opposite of what prohibitionists have been lying about for decades. This one from the Dales Report. An under the radar story that transpired last week, Normal reported via Benzinga that the, de that the detection of THC nor its metabolites in subject systems is correlated to psychomotor performance according to the largest study to date. And so another study found no correlation between THC detection and driving performance found in latest large-scale study. And so, yes, Kevin Sabat, your heart is broken because sadly, everything that you've believed in is not necessarily true. And as THC nor its metabolites in subjects, blood, breath, or oral fluid is correlated with psychomotor performance according to state-funded study. Yeah, because cannabis and alcohol are not the same, so you cannot expect the same outcomes from them. And this comes from the University of California, San Diego. So booyah, fuck you, prohibitionists. And with that, happy to share as former all-star running back Le'Veon Bell says he smoked cannabis before games would still put up big numbers on the field. And I wish more athletes just had the balls, knew their worth, that they were so good that they can't be ignored and that they would just tell the truth um, about some of their real habits and things that made them better. Looking back, that's what I did, Bell said. Just wanted to share this quote. When I was playing football, I smoked. Even before the games, I'd smoke and I'd go out there and run for 150 yards to touchdowns. Obviously, it might not work for everybody, but this is another example of a former NFL quarterback, Chris Sims, uh, explaining that athletes would smoke and some of them would be better and why wouldn't they i think a lot of athletes like to smoke it's better for you than taking prescription drugs or you know drinking alcohol which dehydrates your muscles and hurts joints and things like that so that's where athletes you know want to rely on smoking rather than the the, uh, the alternatives there now listen not every guy in the locker room smoking right that that's that that's you know not exactly the truth but there's certainly a good faction <laughs> And with a guy like Le'Veon Bell, that's rare. You know, that's where it's like, hey, I was on some teams and, and there'd be a few guys that would smoke weed before a game. No doubt about it. On the car ride to the game, they were going to smoke some weed. Or if it was an away game, they were going to smoke some weed in their hotel room before they got in the bus and then go to the game. Right? And the ones that I knew that do that did that, damn. They were better when they were like that. And I think Le'Veon Bell was probably like that as well. Listen, I, I had some teammates, and, and I've told this story before, and, I'm not, I, and I know I'm allowed to tell it because this is my man, and I've told him, I was, but Dwight Smith, right? <laughs> Two interceptions in the Super Bowl, returned them both to the house for a touchdown, right? The only guy ever to have two interception pick sixes. He was a guy that I've told this on my podcast before. He'd smoke weed before the games. Dwight Smith was one of the smartest, most passionate guys I was ever around in football. It's crazy to think that they can recover with all the alcohol or opiates that they want, but if they want to use cannabis post-game to recover, 
It's just blatant bullshit discrimination. But fortunately, we have covered this in the past, just relaying that the NFL inches closer to accepting cannabis for safe pain relief as they ought to have a long time ago. Players now face reduced penalties for testing positive for cannabis. This policy shift enables players to seek alternative pain management options without fear of lengthy suspensions. And so just relaying a bit more, some testimonials from former NFL legends that turned to cannabis and was like, why haven't we been able to use this forever? This is the best pain medication in the game. And ironically, the timing, uh, thank you Dale's report for making this summary, is breaking. The federal ruling absolves the Sackler family behind Purdue Pharma personally of any lawsuits, both future and present, involving their role in the opioid epidemic. Just a reminder that the government does not work for you. It works for the big corporations that lobby to uh, pass laws that favor them and not us, the little guys. And so sadly, they will have to, one, forfeit owner, family ownership of Purdue. They should have had to do decades ago after starting this. Two, pay out $750 million to victims. Laughable at this moment. And three, contribute 5 to $6 billion in cash over time to fight the opioid crisis, starting with a massive recall on all shitty, addictive Purdue products that they fraudulently pushed out there into the market in the first place, and then giving that cash back to as many Americans as possible to try and right the past wrong of the Sackler family. Obviously, that's wishful thinking. Easier said than done, but good to see some sort of justice and that money will be going back to the families affected. These vile people should be fed to the wolves for what they have done. Meanwhile, cannabis and psychedelics are at the mercy of regulators, once again, funded by these companies. And so you cannot make this shit up. We continue to fight, but more on this article if you wanted to read through it from CNN. Court grants Sackler family immunity in exchange for $6 billion opioid settlement. So of course, you can grab the link in the description. Otherwise, I do invite you to pause to read and another big fuck you to Purdue Pharma for calling Tuesday's ruling a victory. I love seeing this precedent set because I can think of other big pharmaceutical companies over the last few years that have defrauded most of humanity, um, especially with the help of Western governments, unfortunately, and I would love it if we can hold them to the same standard that Purdue Pharma was held to um, in the coming years so that we force them to stop their illegal fraudulent operations, possibly sell all of their assets, collect all of their gross profits, and give back as much to people affected by the harms that they caused over the last few years. Call it plan pandemic reparations. What do you think? Let me know in the comments, but back to cannabis news and so on to states. Marijuana moment. Illinois lawmakers approve bill allowing cannabis businesses to claim state tax deductions as partial IRS, IRS 280 fix. So love to see Illinois getting on board with other states doing this. Illinois lawmakers have approved a budget bill that includes provisions that would allow licensed cannabis businesses to take state tax deductions that they're currently prohibited from utilizing at the federal level due to the IRS code known as 280E. And so the legislation, which also contains language directing funding to a cannabis development fund and extends a deadline for conditional licenses to find a storefront past both chambers on Saturday. So that's promising for those extra 185 licenses we've been waiting on for a long time, hopefully coming in June and July based on one of the sources though. Uh, thank you, Killer Chip, for that. Bill now heads to Governor J.B. Pritzker's desk. And so I will update you once this is signed and goes into effect, but no doubt very beneficial for any operators in the state of Illinois. And I know just offhand, Curaleaf, Cresco Labs, Green Thumb Industries, and Verano are four of the tier one MSOs that have a large footprint in Illinois. And so hopefully that will help them keep more profits sooner than later. Don't know when this will go into effect, but I imagine it does once it gets signed. So just to highlight that uh, Pritzker is following other lawmakers. We saw earlier this month, the governor of New Jersey signed legislation to allow this. So a benefit for all those operators in New Jersey, while lawmakers in Iowa, New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia have pursued similar tax relief for their state's cannabis markets. In the meantime, while Congress won't do their damn job. And so very frustrating, of course, but uh, last bit here down last bit here if you wanted to pause to read the rest of the story. Um, but with that, thank you, Sammy J, for making this easy for us to understand. So Illinois has a state corporate income tax at 9.5%. For every $100 million in gross profit in Illinois, that's an added $9.5 million of 280E. Of course, it'd be great if that was gone, and they'd only have to pay $21 million in Fed tax. But of course, that's a bit more that they have to pay because of 280E. Now, example, say a company has $100 million in gross profit with $50 million in selling general and administrative costs in Illinois. State 280E repeal would lower to 25.7%. 75 million from 30.5 million or MSOs or any operator would save 4.75 million per 100 million in gross profit. Doesn't seem like a whole lot, um, but it's better than nothing. And so this is just touching on the article that we just uh, talked about. So if you know any more about this, do let me know in the comments, but still step in the right direction. And of course, we wait for Congress to do their job or for that vote on the Safe Banking Act, which should be coming uh, from now until the end of June. But with that, Tom Engel shares that according to this draft resolution, the New York Cannabis Control Board is set to take up on Tuesday regulators and Verisite, 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 I don't know how to pronounce that fully, but whose lawsuit blocked cannabis sales in parts of the state. And from my understanding, this is like what we saw in Georgia. Some states didn't get uh, licenses, so they sued the state into just delaying licenses for everybody. Equity in action. Um, but apparently the... 
this company is moving to settle the case. And so while I don't believe this has anything to do with the MSOs suing the Office of Cannabis Management for doing such a terrible job, uh, the good news is, is that at least we could see more licenses uh, being given out and actually seeing uh, storefronts, legal storefronts, I should say, in New York finally open if this is really the case. And so hopefully I'll provide more information, but yeah, no comments on this yet. Uh, if we get more info, I will let you guys know. With that, recreational cannabis enthusiasts get closer to legalizing weed in Ohio. Advocates have started collecting signatures to put cannabis on the ballot this November. Interestingly enough, though, get this, this proposal would impose a 10% tax at the point of sale for each transaction, which activists say would raise 350 to 400 mil in new tax revenue annually. What, you think the market's going to do 3.5 billion or 4 billion in its first year? Get the fuck out of here. And so, again, example why activists aren't necessarily the best person to take financial advice from, myself included. So again, take anything I say or any of these stories with a grain of salt. Um, but of course, Ohioans are excited. And main thing to consider is that they have two months to get 124,000 signatures from 44 of Ohio's 88 counties. And so good luck, Ohio. I'm sure you're making progress and will continue to do so. Well, this one, a uh, local one from Fox, North Carolina, lawmakers ready to take new passes at medical cannabis sports gambling. And so at a 10 a.m. meeting Tuesday morning, members of the North Carolina House Health Committee will pick up medical cannabis and pass it around the room. One of two widely discussed bills scheduled to be discussed in the General Assembly on Tuesday. And so this happened yesterday. Didn't get much of an update, but medical cannabis has been passed back and forth for several years. And its latest form passed the Senate on March 1st with robust bipartisan support. The votes on both second and third readings um, in the Senate were 31 to 10 and pardon high hopes. And since then, the bill has sat in the House Rules Committee and no one involved in either chamber would say anything about when it might be considered. So for what it's worth, uh, this is the bill if you're interested, but uh, North Carolina, another state that would benefit from providing a safer non-addictive medicinal alternative to opioids, uh, you know, they can make progress if they want to act on that bill. And so hopefully they will. But with that, marijuana moment, Florida Supreme Court set schedule for legal challenge to 2024 cannabis legalization ballot initiative. At least we have a date for when we're going to hear about this. Before the Supreme Court makes a decision in the case, it said that an initial briefing on the matter is due June 12th. Less than two weeks out. So we'll try and keep you updated out of Florida or any other state story that I've mentioned. But from what we've heard from Brady Cobb, who's a former DC lobbyist and runs a single state operator in Florida, is that the attorney general in Florida always challenges any amendments brought through the legislature. And so while her tone towards cannabis is not ideal, um, main thing is that if they can collect enough signatures that they need to get, and then they can put it on the ballot, and if more Floridians vote for it, why try and get in the way of democracy, right? And so uh, with that, on to some MSO news. Light news this week, but from Green Market Report highlighting the reality of what happens when Congress doesn't try to help one of the fastest growing American industries um, and let them and forces them to continue to operate with both hands tied behind their backs. Two dozen publicly traded U.S. cannabis companies lost $4 billion last year. Well, it's not too bad when you compare that it took 24 U.S. MSOs to lose $4 billion compared to like two Canadian LPs uh, last year or a few years back. And this was like I'm referring to Canopy Growth and Aurora at the peak of them losing money. And so obviously you don't want to see these companies losing money. You want to see them making more money, but you have to look at the circumstances that they're operating within. And again, folks, none of this is advice, but it's worth remembering that the business is different than the temporary scoreboard, right? which is the share price. And if the share price has fallen so far that it just, it seems insane based on what the company is actually producing, that is where opportunity lies, of course. And the fall, the more the share price has fallen, the lower your actual risk. Because, you know, for me, example, I bought in 2021, I'm sitting on heavy bags. And so for any of you buying today, again, this is not advice, but I'm so jealous of you because I think in the future, you're going to make your investment is going to be worth a lot more than it is now. And hence buying low, selling high. And so while the companies did go through this last year, many companies dealt with significant one-time write-downs in 2022 because they purchased companies in 2021 or 2020 at an overvalued price. And then sadly, you know, they didn't end up getting what they thought they were eventually going to get for the total that they paid. And so that has been sort of the trend this last year. Now, financial scoreboard for 24 publicly traded U.S. cannabis companies. I don't think I can fit this all into one frame. I'll try, but net income and loss. Uh, some have suffered a lot more than others. Uh, while Green Thumb Industries, for example, positive net income. While their revenue, you know, obviously some are in the billion mark. Many others are not. And of course, the tier ones, the ones in the billion are probably the safer investments to focus on in the long run versus their gross margins or how much profit they keep after subtracting selling general administrative costs from their revenue. And so um, in total, losing about $4 billion, but in total doing about $8.9 billion in legal market sales, all their goals are going to be to cut these costs and to get these gross margins going up going forward. And so again, just highlighting why I still believe that the MSOs are much better picks than Canadian LPs in the long run if you're looking for fundamental healthy businesses. Um, but again, that's not advice, just my opinion. Um, and so invite you to pause to read from only three of the 24 companies down to Columbia Care uh, and Cureleaf, just two examples. 
and there's it's a quite a long one, so don't not gonna make you grab the link and just try and show you everything that I can. I'll just read from, but even with these write downs, all the way down to the Internal Revenue Service takes about, yeah, sounds pretty fitting for the IRS, big thieves that they are taking our hard-earned money, especially when the government wants to print more money, making all the money we have worth even less. They want to come take even more. Um, you can pause, read from there down to uh, Brockstein also praised Nevada-based Planet 13 and Florida-based Leave. And then from operational cash flow for each company, you can pause down to, but clearly when prohibition ends, that will change the game dramatically. And that's what we're all holding out for. And then last bit here, Brockstein, pause to read, and I will put access to the full data set in the comments so that it's easy for you to grab. And lastly, thank you, John Schwerer, for writing this and highlighting that the risk reward for these US MSOs has never been better. Uh, essentially, when they're making four times the amount of revenue they're making in 2021, and now they're at like 90% of the share price. And so do with that what you will. Well, speaking of Alan Brockstein, who was mentioned in that Green Market Report article, he runs the website New Cannabis Ventures, which is a great resource. And I figured I'd share his weekly email write-up, Why Cannabis Stocks Continue Getting Clobbered. And so I'll share what he has to say in a moment, but from my point of view, we can go to shortdata.ca and we can click largest short positions and we can go to CSE and we can see the top five tier one MSOs, right? We know that in Canada, naked shorting is legal. And until we either get a vote on safe which sees some incremental reform and progress out of Congress, or we get some announcement from HHS and the DOJ about descheduling or rescheduling, Wall Street is just going to continue to short because they know they can. That's at least my reasoning as to why they continue to get clobbered. Um, but for Allen's, uh, share a little bit different perspective, why cannabis stocks are under pressure. You can pause to read this bit. And of course, why this might change. Well, uh, more reasons as well. Main thing, safe getting the eventual vote that we've been promised. Last bit, his outlook, you can pause to read, but I think this last sentence is very fitting. Cannabis stocks are cheap enough in our view for investors with long-term focus, but the market is treacherous in the short term. So this is not advice, invest at your own risk, but another perspective to compare with mine and yours and any others that you have. And so with that, I wanted to bring it back to his site though, because I like to share this visual. Now this is what happened to the Canadian Cannabis LP Index. Now from my understanding, the Canadian LPs IPO'd in like 2014, 2015, and that's not necessarily shared on here, but I invested in my first uh, LP, Aurora Cannabis, in November of 2017, uh, when I started working for a new job and half of my coworkers were investing in this. But before that, I had no idea. I wasn't living in Canada up until May of 2017, so I just had no idea this was happening. But from my understanding, the first wave was on the news that Canada was going to legalize, and or at least going to write legislation and then introduce that legislation saying that they were going to legalize. And then from this point on, I believe that they introduced the legislation, but from here until around October, 2018, they had to make changes, amendments, uh, finalize it, and then debate it and eventually pass it. But of course it was a sell the news event. And by October 18th, you should have sold. Um, and I think it was around this time, July, 2018, when Constellation Brands invested 4 billion in Canopy. And so, yeah, the high that we'd hit, we'd come back down for after Canopy invested, boom, we came all the way back up and you should have sold the news at this point because yeah, Canopy was valued at 25 billion at that time, doing about 10 million in revenue a quarter. Aurora was at 20 billion, doing way less. And then it's, everything's been downhill since then. But what most people don't know, or many don't consider they forget, is that US MSOs IPO'd around this point in time, uh, near the end of 2018. So interestingly enough, when you look at the U.S. Uh, American Cannabis Operator Index, altogether they were valued higher in 2018, 2019 when they IPO'd than what they collectively hit at a peak in February of 2021, which is crazy. And so I don't know about you, but this run up from COVID lows to February 2021 highs reminds me a lot of what we saw in Canada in this first wave. Now, again, that could be wishful thinking, but need I remind you, 23 states have legalized for adult use, which means 27 still haven't. And there's so much room for improvement in states like California, um, New York, of course, New Jersey, and others like that. And so all I'm trying to say is you don't think we're going to get another big wave coming up similar to what we saw in Canada. At this point, once Congress you know, finally takes that next incremental step or we get an announcement from HHS or DOJ about rescheduling or descheduling. I don't know about you, but you know, I'm betting on that there being at least one more big wave that you know we'll capitalize on. But again, you got to remember to sell the news at that point because that's how Wall Street plays us and you don't want to be holding bags at that point in time, or at least I don't want to. I've, I've learned my lessons the hard way. And so with that, before we end off, a little tour around the world. Proposals for regulated cannabis market may end up in European courts as official, um, mostly Europe as opposed to the world in this one, but figured I'd highlight the planned introduction of a legal regulated cannabis market in the Czech Republic may end up in the European Court of Justice, says National Drug Policy Coordinator Jindrich Vaboral at the Cannabis Summit Conference in Prague this weekend. However, he said he believed 
This is this to be the best option as prohibition has been proven not to work and only brings costs and risks. And so while this requires more time, it's good to see that uh, the Czech Republic's effort to legalize might see this taken to court sooner than later. So we could have an official ruling that you know might change what is uh, unfortunately stopping countries from reforming their own drug laws based on their own national sovereignty and what they want to do with it. And so more here if you wanted to pause to read. I mean, I'll bring you down a little bit more if you want to pause to read. Um, but I'm just going to leave that here and we'll update you once we get more information on that. But that is out of the Czech Republic. Love to see that out of Europe. While apparently Portugal has decided to take initiative um, and, and go in that same direction, which we love to see because more pressure would lead to some things sooner than later, we'd hope. But the Liberal Initiative proposes to legalize cannabis for sale and personal use, suggesting that it can be sold to people over 18 years old open presentation of an identification document in physical and online stores such as supermarkets and grocery stores. I love to see how uh, how ambitious Portugal is being with this, um, but the article is in Portuguese, and so I'll put the link in the description. You can probably find a translated version, but while Czech Republic might be taking the EU to court over this, uh, you know, if Portugal is another country on top of Germany, it would help the case um, to just get rid of whatever is blocking these countries' ability to reform their own cannabis laws. Duh! A few reminders, later today at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Toby Chanibus is hosting a Twitter Spaces with CEO of True Leave, Kim Rivers. And so as a True Leave uh, shareholder, I will be tuning in because I need to know if they've integrated those harvest assets sooner than later and how long are we going to have to wait for True Leave to get back to 70% uh, margins and cash flow positive like they were in 2019 and 2020. One of the main reasons we love them so much, but that harvest acquisition sadly set them quite a far away back. And then last bit, if anyone happens to own Tilray for that exposure on major U.S. exchanges, I don't think we've had CFO Carl Merton come on and do an AMA since they were a free up. I could be wrong, but uh, for anyone interested, this is later today at 6 p.m. You'll start getting some answers that you can read through, and of course, all links will be in the description. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Sunday for this week in cannabis news. Have a great week, everybody. Take care.